Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and a rare Sunday show. But I remind you, we have nothing else coming up till next Friday. Got a bit of a great gap while I go and do some film work to earn some actual money. Um, but anyway, welcome back to another episode of our Operation Husky series. Today, Colonel Mark Vlahos will talk about the troop carrier operations over Sicily based on his wonderful book, Leading the Way to Victory. There are links in the description below and there are to Mark's website. But you can, of course, find it at your favorite bookstore or online or library. But I'm going to bring Mark in now. Good afternoon, Mark. How are you today? Hey, good evening to my friends in Europe and afternoon to my friends here. Great to see you again, Paul. Thank, and great to see you. So immediately when you get into troop carriers in Sicily, and we'll go through the presentation, of course, th there's this tragic element that people know about. But before we start the presentation, because when it, I always find as a story, when there's elements of tragedy involved, it does mean that myths can start to build up and things get repeated. Is that your experience when, you know, as someone who's both flown and operated with troop, the, the, the modern equivalent of troop carriers and looked at the, the wartime operations, is, is it something that you find that myths and legends build over the years? Oh, of course. You know, and the old the saying, first reporting is always wrong. You know, that's... Uh, that was uh, throughout my military career. Uh, I found that to be true. And sometimes it, it takes a while to sift through uh, after action, all the reports, you know, and sometimes whoever gets their voice heard first, you know, that's what people focus on. And, and that's what, uh, you know, becomes legend. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and especially as we'll find out, it's 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 several nations working together in Husky. So, so British are writing it from a British point of view, American historians and American point of view. And, and sometimes these paths kind of separate over the years and, and there's not much attempt to kind of connect the stories together and go back and look at source documents. So, uh, Anyway, we've got your PowerPoint. I'm in charge of folks. We'll deal with questions as we go along uh, during the show today. So we're, it's a bit of everything. We're talking about Americans and Brits and, and Operation Husky. So over to you, Mark. And, uh, and yeah, far away with your questions, folks. Hey, Roger that. Uh, so we're going to I put together a, a brand new presentation today. And I know you've had Mike Peters and Ian Murray, you know, some real high class, high profile people on the show. But we're going to look at the operation through a different lens today. Uh, through the eyes of the United States Army Air Force uh, C-47 troop carrier crews. And I'm also going to honor today the 26 American glider pilots that volunteer to fly the mission, sometimes uh, get lost in the story. And, uh, you know, and uh, so we're going to honor them, too. Uh, I'm going to challenge a couple assumptions today and hopefully uh, present some new things, thought provoking uh, uh, material to uh, for people to ponder. So let's go. Next slide. So the, the 51st Troop Carrier Wing was the uh, the first United States Army Air Force C-47 uh, wing to deploy to Europe in uh, in World War II. And so the so the acronyms on the slide there TCW is Troop Carrier Wing. A wing consisted of three groups. So that TCG is Troop Carrier Group, 60th, 62nd, and 64th. Those are what we call groups in military lingo. And each of those groups had four flying squadrons. Okay. Each flying squadron had, at this time in the war, 13 aircraft assigned. So roughly 52 aircraft, per se, in, e in each group. So the 51st Troop Carrier Wing, a couple aircraft at Wing Headquarters. So um, they had slightly about 160 aircraft, slightly little less. And uh, But here's a key point, too. Every squadron you see on here, those three groups, those groups were, those squadrons were formed a year before Pearl Harbor. So they were some of the oldest in the Army Air Forces. So I want to make the point, you know, this wasn't even though they uh, the, the wing was deployed uh, in uh, in uh, June of uh, 42. The, these uh, these squadrons were around prior to Pearl Harbor. So they were some of the most experienced crew members in, in the United States Army Air Force at the time. Next slide. And that brings up uh, this summarizes. I mentioned the. Uh, these groups deployed uh, over to England. They flew the northern route, and they deployed in, in uh, June of 1942. So just six months after Pearl Harbor, they deployed to England. But then they went south uh, to North Africa as part of Operation Torch. So you can see what I did is I summarized the major battle campaigns that these groups flew in the North African campaign. And this is a key point, too, that backs up what I want to say is, so these, these flyers were, they were battle tested, you know, prior to Sicily. The 52nd Troop Carrier Wing, the other brand new American wing, which showed up for Husky to drop the 82nd, they just showed up just prior to Sicily was their first combat mission. 
But the 51st Troop Carrier Wing, which was a portion to the British sector, you can see they were experienced and they, they had they had worked with the British. Uh, John Frost mentions them in his memoirs. He actually jumped into, into Tunisia there. And uh, so you can kind of see my first point. They, they were battle tested at the time. They weren't rookies. But just to, just to hark back to something Marty Morgan said a, a week or so ago, is and you, you used the word mission when you talked about that, because Marty's point was is that Sicily, and you'll be touching on this, of course, later on, is when things become coordinated on a large scale. Airborne forces yes. in North Africa, it was... It was not necessarily small scale, but it was it wasn't part of a of a grand scheme. There wasn't much thought of integrating airborne troops and using them as divisions. It was more drop a few guys over there, pick a few guys up over there. So, would you agree that there's that kind of um, nominal change in in sort of um, how we would describe these these you know, mission to operation? Would that make sense for you? Totally, yeah, and great point, Paul. Because these these missions were very small scale, exactly. They were anywhere from 12 to maybe uh, 39 ships, if you can think about that. So Sicily, the invasion of Sicily was a whole new undertaking, but you think about it, you gotta take baby steps, what we call the building block approach, you know, to missions and operations. So you learn tactics, techniques, and procedures and how to work with each other, you know, cause British paras drop differently than US paras, which, which th these guys trained with, you know, before they left the States. So they rig up differently, they hook up differently, they go out to plane differently, different commands. So there's there's a learning curve, and you're right. Sicily was huge scale, which we're gonna get into a little bit compared to these missions. You know, you're talking uh, 300 C-47, over 300 aircraft uh, between the, obviously the RAF had involved, bombers involved too, but uh, great point. Something I wanna to touch around too, before we get into Sicily, across North Africa, one of the missions that the C-47s flew was medical evacuation missions, and these saved hundreds of British and American lives. This is a photo, actual photograph of a uh, 62nd Troop Carrier Group uh, aircraft flying a medical evacuation mission in North Africa, actual photograph. But this mission continues on today. So this mission was started in World War II. So there were a lot of firsts. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're going to talk first glider tow, first paradrops first medical evacuation mission. So innovation on the fly per se, you know, as tactics evolved. Okay. Picture here, which we're gonna talk mainly about gliders today, but uh, these are some of the first American glider pilots in North Africa. This picture was taken at Relizane uh, in Algeria, actually, in front of a, an American uh, Waco glider there, something near and dear to our heart. But uh, what's interesting too is the first four American gliders that landed in North Africa were actually towed from the Gold Coast of North Africa, a distance of 3,250 miles. Now, most people are not aware of that because most people are aware of Operation Turkey Buzzard missions. You know, so this is comparable to what the British actually did towing their horse gliders down from England to Casablanca and across North Africa. The Americans initially dropped their glider crates on the Gold Coast, the south coast of, of uh, North Africa, so a different route before they started utilizing the closer ports, obviously. But uh, I'm on to, that's an interesting point there. But uh, so the uh, there was a race against time to get uh, there weren't enough horse gliders in North Africa, so the British we had to shift shift thought, and the American uh, Waco gliders had to be used for the invasion of Sicily. So again, there was a race against time to get American gliders there assembled, and that was a feat in itself. Um, but also the British, think about this, British glider pilots were never trained, had never flown this glider in this picture before this time. Um, they, they trained in hot spurs and the horse gliders, the British gliders over in England before deploying. So we also had to had assemble the gliders, but also train British glider pilots within all in a time frame of about two months before the actual invasion. So just a huge crunch of time to do all this. The British glider pilots got about 4.5 hours flying this and 1.2 hours at night. But what's interesting is, and we'll talk about this too, um, up until this point, remember British glider pilots, their doctrine was daylight ops only. So all training of British glider pilots was done in the daytime. Most people don't realize this, an American glider pilot had to land this glider at night to get his wings. So American glider pilots flew daylight and night ops to, to earn their glider pilot wings. Mm. 
Okay. Let's go next slide. So, so, so everybody can kind of visualize here what it looks like a C-47 aircraft towing a glider, a, a, a Waco glider there. You can kind of see that's about a 250 foot long uh, tow rope there that the C-47 is carrying. Uh, that Waco could carry about uh, just under 4,000 pounds of gear, people and gear, give you an idea. Of, it was about 87 feet wingspan. So it was just a little bit smaller than a C-47 actually. But it was made of uh, the frame was made of a uh, tubular steel covered in fabric. So think about like a, a World War One type aircraft, fabric covering wood, whereas the British gliders, you know, were made out of wood, solid wood. So totally different concept, totally different uh, flight control system too. Flaps first, just uh, more this aileron and uh, shifting. But that's an actual photo there of uh, in North Africa of a practice mission. So I talked about that crunch time in two months. So we had to train British glider pilots to fly the glider. The American troop carrier crews had to learn how to tow a glider because when they deployed from the States, they did not tow gliders before they left. So this was new for the crews. This was new for the glider pilots. It's kind of like a, you know, a pickup game trying to put together this team, as you said, a team concept, British and Americans for the invasion of Sicily. So we have a question, uh, Mark, from Gary, who's asking about the significant dis differences between the horse and the wacko in terms of, 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 of flying. Now, yeah. you know, if I go in a, you know, a, a Renault car and then I move to a Ford car, everything is pretty much simple, the same, except I've got to find how the controls for the doors and things work. So to, as, as a complete layman, is, is moving from two glider horse to wacko is it an easy transition or is it like a completely different thing i would say it's completely different especially setting up in a landing pattern because the horse up the description was had flaps like aircraft do as big as a barn door you know big wood flap where they could use that flap and quickly lose altitude very rapidly to to descend rapidly uh through anti-aircraft fire through enemy ground fire whereas the uh the wacko took more of a, a glider, a gliding approach, you know, a little longer and drawn out. It could slip, obviously. There were techniques used, but it was probably the, the biggest characteristics that had to be learned was how to uh, descend rapidly was the, probably the biggest change and set up an approach for landing. Um, the Waco landing speed, I believe, was about 80 knots, was it 60 to 80 knots was what they were looking for in touchdown. I'm, I'm not quite sure the, of the horse uh, landing speed, so I don't want to uh, misquote there. But right, the you. flight characteristics, probably the, the flap system on the Horsa, which the Wacos did not have, was the huge difference that I, I believe. Right, thank you. I'm going to take a drink here. This is a letter of appreciation that uh, um, Major General uh, Hopkinson sent to um, Brigadier General Ray Dunn, a letter of appreciation for all the training that was done prior to Operation Husky. So you can kind of see it was a coordination effort. So the team had to be formed. And trust had to be earned. And uh, but up to this point, you know, things were going well in training, at least, you know, it was a compressed schedule. You can kind of see the, the British generally were pleased. And this is a neat letter of appreciation uh, that I found. I just want to put that up, too. Thank you. I'll take a sip while you're changing slides. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And um, and folks, uh, don't forget, we've got other shows about gliders. Kevin Get did one about the horse gliders. As Mark said, Mike Peter did a show about uh, uh, um, glider operations uh, prior to Husky and, and North Africa. And we did the one with Greg Way about German gliders. So we've got quite a little uh, database about of glider shows, which is which is great because they, they are the unsung part of, of, of airborne forces, in my humble opinion. But back to you, Mark. Sure. And... Uh... So this, this slide here lists the major mission taskings, and we talked missions, that the 51st Troop Carrier Wing, which was apportioned to the British for Operation Husky, got tasked to fly. Now, I mentioned briefly the, the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing. The other brand-new American Troop Carrier Wing was apportioned to drop the 82nd Airborne, and they were brand-new. They had just arrived in North Africa, actually, in June. So they were brand-new to the show. The, so the, the British actually got... The best of what the Americans had at the time, you know, experience wise, crew member wise, flight in time. Think about it. Most of your crew members in the 51st Troop Carrier Wing probably had 500 combat hours of flying across North Africa up to wow. this time. From think about it, Operation Torch, November of 42 to uh, July of 43. You know, that's six months in theater there that uh, 
six, seven months, actually, you know, that was combat time. Uh, in Operation Torch, uh, some C-47s were shot down actually by French aircraft. So these aircraft were under fire before Sicily. It wasn't the first time that they were going to see fire. And three, three C-47s from the 60th group were actually forced and shot down on Operation Torch with casualties, air crew members and paratroopers, which uh, so they were experienced. So these are the mission taskings. Obviously, these are code names, uh, Ladbrook, uh, Fustian, Husky One. Um, so those are code names for missions for, for you folks out there who aren't military types. OK. Let's talk about the, the, the first major mission. And we talked about size and scope, you know, the, those smaller missions in North Africa. So here we are. A brand new team is going to try to put together 144 tug glider tow combinations into one massive formation. But think about that difficulty there. You got three different types of aircraft. You've got uh, the C-47s, you got the Halifax bombers and uh, the Albemarles from RAF uh, 38 wing. And all these aircraft fly at different airspeeds, okay? The two types of gliders are actually horse gliders involved also, the British ones for the coup de main force. It's just only eight of those in this mission, mainly the American Wacos. But so when you got to plan this air strike package, the slower aircraft, obviously the C-47s towing the Wacos, have to go first in the flow because the British bombers have to fly to higher airspeed so they don't stall out, you know, and same with the horse and gliders. So there's a lot of coordination and timing involved to even, they took off from like six, eight different airfields, trying to think marshalling up in the air and get, try to orchestrate this plan to get everybody in the right position just to even fly in route. So 144 ships, uh, quite an undertaking for this point in the war. We talk about major, major size mm -hmm. increase, you know, in an airborne strike package. Um, trying to think what else I should say at this point. But so this was the first, Ladbroke was the uh, the first uh, task mission. And um, let's talk about, uh, okay, some of the risks involved. This slide lists, well, I'm talking here, um, Mike Peters in his book, uh, and he, I believe he talked about this, too, when he was on your show. He talked about a tense meeting between Lieutenant Colonel George Chatter Chatterton, who was the commander of the British Glider Pilot Re um, uh, Regiment, and the, the, had it had with the, the uh, commander of the Airborne Division, Major General Hopkinson, about Lieutenant Colonel Chatterton was very concerned about the experience level of his pilots getting tasked to fly one, a night mission, which was against British doctrine at this time. And he looked at the, the landing zones, and small and on rocky cliffs and things like that. Uh, he looked at the uh, the experience level of the American tug crews, you know, just where the team was at this point. Um, let me talk about some, some other risks. And what was interesting in that tense meeting, the major general said to the lieutenant colonel, hey, if you're not going to fly this mission, I'll find someone who will. So he was under and said, I'm going to walk out of the room and I'll be back in 30 minutes. If you're still here, I'll assume that you want to accept the risks involved with, with this mission. So it was General Montgomery that drove the night mission tasking, who wanted the, the gliders to land near the bridges before the main force came ashore. So these were some of the risks. And here's something most people don't realize, too. This was the, probably the only time in the war where a glider release point a tug ship attempted to release a glider over water at night. And most people don't realize 3,000 3, yards offshore, that's just nearly two miles offshore in itself. When you, I'm going to show another slide here, and uh, you'll see another picture slide here in a couple slides, where the LZs were, and the landing zones were even further in, inland. One of them, one of the, the Waco uh, LZs was another mile in inshore. So you're releasing the gliders three miles. If you're right on right on flight path, you're releasing the glider three miles uh, from the landing zone, which is but and here's the unexpected. We always say uh uh you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and sometime the enemy is your is weather. Uh upon when the crews were walking out to their aircrafts to take off from Tunisia. There are gale force winds going on up to 35 to 40 miles per hour and uh, out of the west, northwest. And we're going to talk about the effect that had. So lots of risks. And uh, 
just flying 200 feet over water for 400 miles at night in a tight formation, I think is very risky. Uh, myself personally, having flown thousands of hours and C-130s in night formations myself. So, And who chose those release locations? Was there a combination of factors or was there sort of one person in charge of this? Well, there's. we're going to talk about what drove that when we when we look at the uh, um, the actual war order, which what drove that release lane offshore was the British were very concerned that the American C-47s did not have self-sealing gas tanks. Yeah. So they were afraid that if they took anti-aircraft fire, they're going to become flying, you know, death trap coffins towing the gliders and get shot down. Um, what was really interesting, I mean, that's a true statement. The C-47s did not get self-sealing gas tanks till later in the war. But when you look throughout the war, these, these aircraft took a beating. So the, the 3,000 yards offshore was directed to keep the by the British to keep the Americans out of anti-aircraft ground fire zone because they were worried about they needed these aircraft for follow-on missions. There was only a finite number, in, you know, that we had in theater. So they were a precious resource. So that decision, that release zone offshore was picked to protect the American C-47s from, from ground fire. That's that's the main reason they did that. Okay. And, and the same with the low altitude. The drop altitudes were, were low, and we're going to talk about that too, was to keep them low behind that that angle, you know, for the for the guns to pick them up. And my other so, question is, and I'm because I'm trying hard to look at this yeah. without the knowledge of that I have of knowing what happened with the actual operation. I'm trying to come at this from the point sure. of view of the fact these guys had flown missions in North Africa that had more or less gone to plan, that, that as you say, some of these have been training for, for months in theatre, years in total. Maybe there is a little bit of, a, not overconfidence, but there's a there's a belief in the system. And then when it cranks up the size of Husky, it, 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 it exposes some of the flaws. But I'm trying to put myself into the mind oh, yeah. coming out of North Africa with a sense of this, this, this doctrine is working. You're, yeah, exactly, Paul. The uh, Well, up to this point, too, I should have mentioned this also. All those missions flown in North Africa, those were daylight paradrops, yeah. daylight supply drops. So the American troop carrier pilots, while experienced, they were not experienced in night formation flying. And I'm going to talk about that, too, when I talk about the four-ship flight element. We're going to take a look at that in depth because, yeah, this is the perf perfect transition here because I think to – to really understand, and, and for a lot of people, I think this will be a, a new lens that people, no one's really talked about before, okay? This is a key point right here. People need to understand the, the four-ship element that the Americans were trying, attempting to fly that night for the first time in combat. Um, the four-ship glider tow, single tow glider. So the image taken on, the image on the left is taken from the ground up. You can, so you're looking, you're looking straight up, and the, obviously the, uh, the diagram on the right is from an actual field order. So you can kind of see, this is what we call right echelon formation, where each aircraft is an echelon right. It's a little further back. They're flying off formation lead. The element lead is in, in the far left aircraft. Their job is to navigate to the release point. The three wingmen, their job is to maintain their position on lead. That's their only job. Okay. So... But this is one, let's talk about this flying at night, okay, having flown night formations. The way pilots, they look at the lights on the aircraft in front of them. That's how they determine their position in formation. That's the only way they can do it at night is look at the formation lights on the aircraft in front of them. So imagine flying that formation for 400 miles, 200 feet over the ocean, okay, and gale force winds, which we're going to talk about more too and, and how they affected that. So it was, it was crazy. That's a tight formation. You know, there's only a couple hundred feet laterally, about 200 feet laterally between each glider tug, tug combination. Now here's another key point. I mentioned um, everybody's job lead, lead goes to the release point. Everybody else's job is to follow and stay out of leads way. So if, if lead drifts, right guess what? Everybody else has to drift right. If lead goes left, everybody else has got to go left. Their job is to maintain that integrity. And But here's something people don't realize either, unless you've flown. When you're flying a tight formation like this, 
when something goes wrong, if one aircraft drifts out of position, the only safety margin, the only way to increase safety margin is to go right away from lead. See, so think about that too. When this, when we look at the way this formation was oriented, oriented to the shoreline and where the wind was coming, well, you're going to see that on another slide. That did, didn't help things at all because as, as things started going wrong, and I'm going to discuss that in detail, but I wanted people to get a concept of this four ship element first before I talk about that in detail later, what went wrong in my analysis. But any questions on this right here, this formation? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay. Let's go. Just a quick slide so people can understand how they loaded this glider. The, the cockpit of the American uh, Waco glider was actually on a hinge that could uh, fold up kind of like the modern C-5 today. You can see the British Airborne uh, Forces Air pushing a Jeep up onto the glider. And uh, what was interesting too, though, the small size of the Waco, the Waco was, because of its smaller size, it could carry a Jeep and its crew, or, or it could carry the six pound anti-tank uh, weapon and its crew, but couldn't carry both to make that gun mobile. So you had to have the gun and the Jeep in separate glider. So the horse obviously was larger. The British glider could do both that. And uh, so the British were not happy with this at all, obviously. But I need to make another key point that I discovered in my research. I know Mike knows this too. Mike Peters does. But remember, the uh, the horse glider was built upon the, uh, the pl platoon tactic, per se. It was the platoon size stick, 32 men, uh, the anti-take Jeep and the gun you know, it could all fit in their British larger glider by itself. And you'll see a picture of a horse later. Folks who haven't seen one, excuse me. But uh, what the British Royal Engineers did when there were not enough horses, obviously, in North Africa to fly, the British, obviously, if they had their way, they would have flown all their own gliders, which were larger. And all their load planning, which they practiced for all the time, was based on that horse. So the load planners had to shift to the smaller uh, Waco gliders. And so all the load plans had to be redone. But what the British did too, and this is a key point too, that most people might not be aware of. The British Royal Eng had the Royal Engineers add three more wooden seats to that Waco. So the Waco was based on, I said, could carry a little under 4,000 pounds. That was 13 men plus the two pilots. Okay. So that was 15 men. That glider was built to, uh, to carry 15 men. When the British added three more wooden seats, you had three more combat-equipped paratroopers, okay? That's 700, 800 more pounds of weight because that's 16 paratroopers plus the two pilots. When you look at the load manifest, not every glider carried 18, but there are gliders that carried 18. So that was overstressing the Waco, which is another contributing factor to some of these, especially when we talk about the headwind they went in later. So flight characteristics, obviously, and, and so many of the glider pilots mentioned in their reports, as soon as they were released, and they hit that wind, they knew immediately they were not going to make sure. Not only because they were too far from it, the ones that were too far, but even the ones, because of the low release altitude, even the ones that were pretty much on course, and we're going to talk about the front half of that formation, was on course, they couldn't make land anyway because of that gale force wind we're going to talk about later. But next slide. Let's talk about... Uh, uh, the American glider pilots, I mentioned that at the 11th hour, there were 26 American glider pilots that uh, the British were short, 26 pilots. They went to the they went to the Americans and, uh, hey, we need some help. We need help filling cockpits. So each troop carrier squadron was tasked to provide five American glider pilots. Uh, and what they did is. They, they went and asked the American glider pilots, and there were various ways this was done. Some, some squadrons, the squadron commander just verbally went to the people. And other squadrons, no kidding, they went into the mess tent, and there was a little post-it note on the wall on the bulletin board, we need volunteers to fly a mission with the British. And they just listed names. And the first, first five names got drafted. And what was interesting, too, is when the American glider pilots volunteered to fly this mission, they did not know what they were volunteering for. They did not know, and this was at the 11th hour, they did not know the invasion of Sicily was planned for the next day. So that's what they were volunteering for. They also didn't know the huge differences in doctrine between British glider pilots and yeah. American glider pilots. A British glider pilot, when he lands, he becomes an infantryman. He's part of that 
air landing brigade built into the airborne division, the American glider pilots were assigned to the Air Corps side, the Army Air Forces side. They were assigned to the troop carrier squadrons, so they weren't trained in gong ground combat. They were not part of the American Airborne Division. They were different. So they were kind of caught in the middle here, one without the training to be an infantryman, okay? Two, the, Ameri the mission of, of the American glider pilot once on the ground at this point in the war until we were find it was to try to get back safely to American lines, not stay there and fight with the, with the ground pounders, but to get back to fly another mission. So huge differences in, in doctrine and training here what these guys signed up to do. So it's it's pretty crazy. In this picture here, um, four of the five guys in this picture actually flew Ladbrook and Fustian. So these were some of the first these were the first some of the first glider pilots in North Africa. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about the uh the the long route here that was involved. If it's kind of a busy slide, but this is an original chart here. You can kind of see Tunisia on the left side, you can see the coastline of Tunisia where all the British and American airfields were. The British bombers were stationed there, the Halifaxes and the Albemarles, the American C-47s. So they had to fly, I said, 400 miles. If you can kind of see the island of Malta there is about uh, bottom left center. You can make out the island of Malta there where they fly due east to Malta. Then they turn to the northeast and you can kind of see the, that's the southeast coast of Sicily there up in the top right there. So you can kind of check the flight path that the, the aircraft had to fly. So I mentioned about flying that formation at night, 200 feet over water for three hours. At least Malta was a, a good navigational checkpoint. Heck, it was an island. They set up searchlights, you know, because at this point in the war, the night navigation skills and night formation flying skills of the American troop carrier pilots was pretty low. Now, there's only a navigator in every four C-4 C-47, so only Element Lead had an Air Force navigator involved. So it was challenging, to say the least. Um, but I talked about those, those gale force winds on takeoff. That uh, So during the flight briefing, okay, I mean, obviously the men are, they're at the flight briefing prior to takeoff. They could see the winds, you know, were gusting in, in North Africa. They knew it was going to be a bumpy flight. But I want to read, this is actually an actual excerpt from an American um uh, navigator who was uh this is second lieutenant paul gale and this is a quotation from him i'm going to read this just as one of his uh he wrote this uh, later what he observed in the briefing the winds were gale force winds up to 45 knots we had not been given any change of release coordinates when you went to the briefings they told you where you were going what routes they expected you to fly and where they expected you to release these gliders which included latitude, longitude, and altitude. We received no information on a change of these coordinates, which had to be changed because the coordinates that we had planned for were five or 10 knot or calm weather winds. So the planning factor that release altitude did not take into account, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit here, was a direct headwind once released. The gliders were on a 350 foot tow line I had mentioned earlier. And the Waco glider had a gliding ratio of, of roughly, if it was loaded properly, you know, and weighted properly, of about 10 to 12 to 1. So that was your gliding ratio for every. But the planned drop altitudes for the for the Waco gliders were only 1,400 feet and 1,800 feet, you know, three miles from the drop zone. The horse's altitude was higher, about 4,000 feet. The horses actually had enough altitude to even to fight those winds and, and make it on land. So a little bit, but uh, at the, even at the flight briefing, the Americans, this is, this is documented also recommended to the British to increase the release altitude by 2000 feet of the Wacos. The British declined to do this at this time. And I believe again, that was, they were so worried about the, the aircraft staying below the angle, the deck angle, angle range of the anti-aircraft guns on shore there. So that was the British, Concern, obviously, people are looking at different things, different factors. And uh, what's interesting, too, is I'm going to talk about the uh, the release orders, too. So the American troop carrier pilots on this mission were ordered, this is in the British field orders, to fly 3,000 yards offshore release, okay? The release altitudes we already discussed. And then, which was, I think, very controversy at the time, in the British orders, the troop carrier pilots were ordered 
if the gliders did not release themselves to release the gliders. And this is written in the British field orders, okay? So the American glider pilots were just looking at this in disbelief because this was against American training doctrine mm -hmm. and for a troop carrier pilot to release a glider. You know, it was usually the discretion of the glider pilot who would release himself from that tow rope. And, and you know, that's what they they were trained to do that. Um, again, why was this? I can only speculate, but I believe it was. I think the British just wanted to make sure they the forces needed to get there. They were worried about, you know, some of these aircraft turning around and bringing the gliders back if they missed the release point, if they, they didn't think it was safe to let go. If you give them a choice to err on the side of safety, you know, they're going to do that. And they wanted every glider on the ground because it was such a tight uh, loading squeeze anyway. They needed every available combat force on the ground. So I think that was the thought process. That, that makes sense. M Marty Morgan said about James Gavin in the 82nd, we can assume it extends to British, is that the, 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 the paratroop commanders, the glider infantry commanders, everybody had been told that this is the one where airborne landings are proceeding. Everything else is the first time it's happening. The, you know, there's a lot of weight on uh, on your shoulders, a lot of burden on this. This your bit has to work well because there are thousands and thousands of lives dependent on your bit going well, which is, as we said earlier, different to how airborne operations had been in North Africa, where they were mostly sort of separate and isolated of their own thing. So I think there's a, there's a lot of feeling of pressure everywhere that there's a whole lot building on this and oh, you know, oh yeah and james gavin said you know he, he in his memoirs you know he felt that that this that burden that burden that you know that he can't say no you know, they, they were facing as paratroopers you know incredible winds winds that normally would cancel any operation so i think that i think you're right i think there's everybody is aware that this situation is isn't ideal uh in terms of the weather in terms of some of the systems but there's a lot of pressure. There's, there's. It's not direct pressure, but it's, 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 it's there. It's in the air. Oh yeah, and you know, some people will sit there and say, "Hey, it's easier for Mark to Monday morning quarterback this thing and identify those risks afterwards." But I'll just say this: having commanded a flying squadron in combat myself, the job of leadership is to reduce risk. Okay. Yeah. And save lives. So that's just. I want to make that point too, from an, from an, a former Air Force commander here. You know, so could some of those risks have been mitigated? I say yes, just by increasing drop altitude. But again, there are different thought processes. People would, you know, focus on different things. I'm just looking at it from the, the air crew lens who had to release these gliders. So think about it from the troop carrier perspective. You know, that's a perspective I'm trying to, yeah. the lens I'm trying to, you know, talk to today. So and we're, and we're totally grateful you're lens. giving us this version because what it, it if, if we were to be doing five shows back to back from the point of view of, I don't know, the paratroopers, the point of view of the guide infantry, the point of view of the troop carriers, the point of view of planners, the point of view of, of, of people in the Navy below, they'd all give a slightly different version of the historians because they're seeing it from their, from their point of view. That's, that's, that's kind of how history works, but we want you for your expect expertise in this field. So um, we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. We're loving it by the way. Oh yeah. Cause Combat, there's risks in combat. You're not going to mitigate all risks in combat. That's never going to happen. I just, I, I want to say that too, so folks understand that. But, you know, from the planner perspective, they're just trying to give these guys a chance to execute the mission. What they believe is the best rule set, the best course of action to execute that mission from the planners. This is just uh, where, the, where the glider landing zones were. This is kind of a blow up. You can see the city of Syracuse there on the, on the southeast coast of Sicily there. Uh, LZs one and two. Down, the shaded areas down on the bottom, those were the uh, the the Waco uh, LZs there. You can see that the LZ1 was a further mile inland. LZ2 was, by the way, there were 100-foot cliffs right there on the shoreline too. So that LZ2 was on top of a 100-foot cliff, a little flat area. And some of the gliders even mentioned, you know, with that headwind, they could have made land, but they couldn't get over that 100-foot cliff. They were getting ready to, you know, to put down. So they had to turn parallel to the coast and let down in the water just because they, they didn't have enough juice altitude, you know, left in them to even get over that 100-foot cliff. But these landing zones, they were rocky. They had stone walls. They were not ideal at all, and they were small. You look at the landing zones later for Market Garden, hell, these things were huge, you know, mm -hmm. football fields wide, you know, where you could you could take that four-ship element and uh, and drive it through, you know. But this, is, this was just – for this level of training and early in the war, 
look at the size of those horse LZs. You know, we're going to talk about uh, Sergeant Galpin's horse a little bit, but extremely small right by the bridge. You can see the objective area. The paratroopers and gliders were supposed to take was that bridge there. You can kind of see that highway coming out of south out of Syracuse and the bridge over the canal there. So that, that helps orient people right there. Okay, let's go slide. Someone had asked a question about that release point. You know, who picked that release point? This is kind of gives you the idea what that 3,000 yards looked like. You can see there were some strongholds. So you can kind of see that re release zone there. And uh, again, that's two miles offshore. Those C-47s are flying a course uh, two miles offshore. You can kind of see, orient yourself. North is direct, the north arrow there. But we're going to see on the following slide, so those, those 40 knot headwinds were from the northwest. So you kind of see those arrows heading towards the LZs from the release point directly into the wind, you know, that 40 knot wind. Those gliders, 40 knots on the nose as soon as they were released. So very difficult situation. Okay, slide. Let's go next slide, Paul. Yep. Yep, with that. Uh, hang on. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, hang on, there this we go. Yep, right, yep. Yeah, right there. So I talked about, you know, once they checked Malta, the formation turned basically to the northeast to like a 037 course. They hit the southeast coast of Sicily, and then they flew almost almost due north up the coastline to their release point, which we just saw in a previous chart. Okay. But once passing Malta, the, the formation was blown right a course. I talked about those high crosswinds. This is the formation lead navigator, Second Lieutenant Richard H. Kramer from the 10th Troop Carrier Squadron. Believe it or not, he actually did a very good job of killing the drift. And I'm going to tell you in a little bit, I believe, and you're going to see by looking at the results, the front half of that formation was actually probably within a quarter to a half a mile of that release chart, charted course. And uh, this is actually in Kramer's own words right here. This is what he stated. It was hard to get a good drift meter reading because of flying low over the white caps. So remember, they're flying at 200 feet. A drift meter is how a navigator would judge how the wind is affecting the aircraft. Remember, if, if you're flying an aircraft straight ahead and the wind's coming off your left wingtip across your aircraft, the wind's going to blow your aircraft to the right. So that's called drift effect. And determine how far right is the job of a navigator, what the drift effect is. And the drift meter was a, an instrument that helped them do that. It was basically through tactical pilots. They would kind of look at a line on the ground visually and, and and see how the aircraft was actually tracking to that line. And then you have to change alter course into the wind. You'd actually like sailing a sailboat was you tack into the wind and an aircraft in this instance, the aircraft would have had to turn left into the wind, turn left just to fly straight. You're actually, you know, flying a course further left, but the wind's blowing your right. But so Richard Kramer, actually did a, a really damn good job. And we're going to talk about the lead results on, on the next slide. Let's go to the next slide now. Now I'm going to send some, spend some time on this slide because remember we already talked about that four-ship element. So I want to give you a visual now of what's going on, okay? But here's – I talked about the, the in-route airspeed was 125 miles per hour for the C-47s towing the Waco gliders. The bombers flew higher altitude uh, airspeed because of their stall speed and in the horse that could fly a little faster than a Waco too. But so the, the British bombers at the back of the formation further back were flying higher airspeeds, but the Americans were flying 120 knots. Remember the slower you go, the more the, the wind's going to affect you. And to release the gliders, remember they were, they were down about, you know, a couple hundred feet above the water. They had to climb up to their release altitude. So they're, actually slowed down to about 105 to 110 miles per hour for release. So you're, slight, you're climbing slightly to 800 feet, okay? You're slowing down. But here's this is part of the problems right here, which I'll talk about how we solved it in my career when you had big formations. The whole formation would slow down at the same time, but they didn't do that. So as the lead four-ship element, couple elements, start slowing down and climbing, what are the following elements doing? They're catching up. They're stacking up. They're getting on top of the leading elements. Can kind of, kind of see what the picture I'm trying to paint here? It's the formation is becoming compressed from the back of the formation to the front. So that's happening at the same time. Okay. 
Now, remember, the release point was 3,000 yards offshore. Now, the troop carrier pilots, they weren't trained to judge distance offshore. So giving them a, uh, a, a chart to fly, you know, you can guesstimate, you know, offshore, looking at the, the town of Syracuse off your nose, how far, but it was night. The moon was off to the left. They were looking to the moonlight. And then once the searchlights and anti-aircraft batteries open up, you got lights coming off your, you know, your left, you're looking into, you can't see the shoreline. They couldn't judge. So it, it only got worse as after, after the, the back of the formation. But we're going to talk about how the front half of the formation was actually on course very well and why things went south real quick. And that's, this is the total lens. This is a brand new lens I'm going to try to describe here. Okay. So in my analysis right here, folks, talk about the high velocity of the crosswind, the brief to release altitude, Tulu I mentioned, and now the actual four ship element flown by the Americans that added to the disaster. And I want to talk about that. And, and I believe more of the blame falls upon this four ship element in, in what they did later to mitigate this than some of the British reports about the Americans running from anti-aircraft fire and going right away from it. I don't, I don't believe that's the case. And I'll tell you why. I know some people may disagree with me. It's, but you know, it's all up to interpretation. Only nine of the British glider reports mentioned, uh, how can I say, uh, evasive action, you know, really bad evasive action by the, their tow plane, tug pilot, you know, ev taking evasive action because of, and not all of it was tied to anti-aircraft fire. Some of that tug evasive action was to avoid crashing into themselves. I'm just sharing this. It's thank, it's amazing there was no mid-air collision at this point with, with that formation becoming compressed and on top of each other, okay? And uh, so, and what happened also, I talked about how the only way to get safe space is to go right. Once, once lead starts coming right or something goes right, an aircraft drifts right because of prop wash, when you're flying in that tight formation, prop wash, the airplanes behind you are actually in prop wash of the aircraft in front of you. This happened in my C-130 career too. It pushes you. You got to fly out of the prop wash. So it'll push you right also. So those third and fourth, these four ship elements, number three and four, one, they were the furthest from the shore. They got the worst of it. They were pushed further to the right. And as the aircraft started stacking up on top of each other, it only made things worse once the gliders released. And, and sadly, many of the, some of the C-47s missed their release point and, and they did something absolutely wrong. They actually went forward, turned around and came back and attempted to release flying in the opposite direction of the formation. Think about that. That just totally porked up the rear end of this formation. And you'll, you'll, when you look at the reports, there are actually quite a few what they call re-attacks when they actually came back around so this formation, you had C-47s and gliders flying back through the formation that missed their initial release point. And that's where things really got foobarred. That's where they, they were, when I, when I wrote my 60th book, I wrote accounts of troop carrier pilots. They were dodging other gliders and other aircraft because trying to, these four ship gliders releasing at the same time, that close, crazy. And, and so just to jump in, Mark, do, do you think, and maybe you're going to be covering this yourself anyway, yeah. but do you think the crosswinds uh, and the weather was a convenient kind of coat hook to pin everything onto rather than examining the four ship system, rather than examining some other things? You know, I get the same thing in Normandy with just the, 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 the catch all. It was all about the hedgerows when the hedgerows actually were, were showing up other deficiencies here or there and everywhere. But it, in this case, it was a convenient thing to just say, okay, it's just the weather. Yeah, well, it was obviously a contributing factor to the disaster. Was it the 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 only point? No. Um, what's interesting, too, is, and I'm going to talk about, when the American troop carrier pilots landed, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, mm -hmm. they actually thought they flew a successful mission. They thought they executed the mission. It wasn't until after all the reports where the gliders landed started coming in that the true sense of the disaster came out. So the American troop carrier pilots actually thought they did a bang up job. The, there was 137 that six of the gliders never got out of North Africa. You know, so there were about 137 that actually launched on a mission. They, they were, you know, that were released. Um, 
But as we're going to get into this a little later, so, but I mentioned the troop carrier pilots mentioned flying into each other. And then the back half of the formation stacked up. You find accounts about the troop carrier pilots mentioned there were C-47s on top of them, underneath them, actually accounts where they couldn't go anywhere. They were, they were boxed in and, and the only way to get safe was to go right further away from shore. It was the only thing they could do. And uh, it just added to the disaster, this plan. And here's a key point too, a lesson learned, Paul. I'm going to jump ahead here. When you look at that four ship element, when I looked at Operation Varsity, the 314th troop carrier group flew the same four ship single tow glider element. See number three and four, that second two ship in the back? For Operation Varsity, they actually separated themselves 2,000 feet from lead at slowdown point prior to glider release to get more space in and to give the glider pilots, the gliders give them, you know, uh, deconflicting their approach paths that they were flying to the LZ because this was just a big foobar mess. I mean, it was when you read what about the aircraft and the gliders dodging, I think they were trying to avoid each other as much as they were, you know, the anti-aircraft fire. So, wow. and, and not one troop carrier pilot mentioned in his after action report that he was driven offshore from anti-aircraft fire. Now, the American general said later he thought it was a contributing factor, okay? But he didn't fly the mission. What caused him to say that? Was it, you know, the, the accounts from the British, you know, that he was listening to his British counterparts? You know, you know, when you got the perspective in the back of the glider, you don't know what's going on. Just like a paratrooper doesn't know what's going on in the cockpit. The trooper in the back doesn't know what that glider pilot or C-47 pilot's facing. So I, I believe it was more to it than just the, uh, the, the AAA you know, drove, you know, too many gliders went in the water, didn't make land because of the AAA, but, but we're going to talk about the results here soon. Okay. I think I, let me, let me just look at my notes to see if I beat this to death. Um, hey, I want to make one other point about having been an aviator myself. When you're flying that four ship right echelon formation, after release, those guys plan to make a right 180 degree turn and fly back, you know, the same way. You would never, ever make a, a turn into your formation wingman. If you're lead, if you're turning right, 180 degree turn, your wingman two, three, and four have to stay inside you on the turn. So you're putting in in a really crappy low energy position where they're going to lose. You're setting them up for disaster. So that that was poor planning too. You know, I don't know if people can understand what I'm trying to say there, but uh, flying back into your own formation, what a mess. But uh, I I talked about that. Oh, I need to cover one more thing. If you could go back one slide, Paul. This is a key point right here. I, I, I mentioned how the lead navigator did a good job, and I want to I want to state some facts to back up what I'm trying to describe here. The lead 60th troop carrier group in the front of the formation was more accurate. 25 gliders reached land, 23 landed in the water, and three returned. Okay. The back half of the formation, the 62nd troop carrier group, remember, there was the ones that had it just got worse back there. The further back you were in this formation, the worse it became. Listen, look at their stats. Only uh, 23, I'm sorry, only 13 reached land. Vice 25 from the, the group in front of them. 13 land, 36 landed in the sea, and two returned, you know. So I think that kind of backs up what I'm trying to describe here. Mm -hmm. how the formation just disintegrated, and it, it really did. And sadly, that when once the gliders went down in the water, that wind was pushing them further offshore, which added to disaster. I'm going to cover here when we look at the results about the drownings. I'm going to certainly cover that too. But okay, let's go forward now. So I, many of the gliders landed in the sea is what uh, Sicily is known for as a disaster. But there were, there were some bright spots. And I'll just tell you, Mike Peters did an outstanding job in, on your last show when he described Sergeant Galpin's horse the glider landing in the middle of LZ3 there. And I'm not even going to attempt out to Mike there, but he covers it well in his book. But and probably one of the most amazing feats of the war, folks. That that's a horse of glider for the I know there's a few people brand new on here, some of my friends who, who don't know what that looks like. But that's the British glider made out of all wood that actually landed, made it to land, landed in the middle of the LZ, and this you know, the platoon there, those 32 guys headed for the bridge. And that's a picture of the bridge on the right there, which was their objective. So Despite the horrific, you know, numbers of gliders going down in the sea, those that did make it to land, remember, those troopers had an objective to meet. And even though most of the gliders, they were very small in number, 
they headed for their objective, and that's what paratroops do. You know, they had a mission to do. So a small force of about 72 to, to 80 people total, including two American glider pilots, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, and one six-pounder anti-tank gun, did eventually make it to the bridge where they became, they captured the objective, but they were fought counterattacks all night against horrendous odds and finally had to, they lasted until, I don't know, a little past 6.30 in the morning or so. They finally overrun, but they uh, they were captured. They had to surrender, but uh, they were actually re released uh, pretty quickly because the leading elements of the amphibious force actually landed and, and, and freed them. But uh, so there's a picture of Sergeant, Sergeant Galpin's horse. Uh, let's go next slide. Let's talk about the... Uh, the, the, the two American glider pilots that made it to the bridge, uh, glider stick number 13, and that's an amazing photo right there. You can actually, if you look at the glider, see the number 13 chalk down there? That's stick 13. So that's an authentic photo there of glider stick 13 with the British, uh, British troopers there prior to loading. And that was Flight Officer Samuel Fine was one of the Americans. And uh, I'm going to read you his account. This is just, uh, this is in Sam Fine's own words there. There were 72 British officers and troopers on the bridge and one American, me, when the fascist counterattacked. We held it as long as we could, but we were got down to 15 defenders and our ammunition ran out. We had to surrender. They were using heavy machine guns and a howitzer. Just before we surrendered, I was wounded in the neck. So he was down to his last two rounds of ammunition for his pistol. He was already wounded in the, in the right shoulder upon landing. And then the third time he was wounded in the neck there. And that kind of gives you the, the intensity of the fight at the bridge mm. there. I mean, it was horrendous. You know, there were 15 guys, you know, when they surrendered that were still capable of fighting and they were running out of ammunition that weren't wounded, you know, seriously wounded. Um, let's go next slide. But when Sam wrote that account, he didn't know that flight officer Russell D. Parks in glider stick 52A also had made it to the bridge and was part of the defense and uh, Russell Parks uh, actually uh, said this about his landing. He landed 2.5 miles southwest of his LZ. He met slight AAA upon landing. 15 yards after landing, they hit a wall, which probably a stone wall is what a lot of the, the gliders ran into because it was so rocky and all. But uh, something else I want to mention. So those 26 American glider pilots that flew this mission they were awarded, and General Montgomery allowed them, gave them a British Red Beret, an Airborne Beret. They were allowed to, to wear British glider pilot wings, okay, after this mission, and they were each issued a stand gun. So this is the only time in World War II that I know about, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, that American glider pilots were allowed to wear British glider pilot wings, given a Red Beret, you know, that actually flew this mission. So General Montgomery, you know, he was proud of these guys that volunteered and he gave them those red berets prior to takeoff actually because they were part of the team they were part of the british first airborne division and they were going to combat you know with the badge of honor that red beret and that's the weird thing mark you know we talked about with marty is that we could examine and we are examining the 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 errors uh, made with with planning this airborne operation in terms of, of the structure of it but husky absolutely sealed the deal on how <laughs> good individual groups of paratroopers and airborne soldiers can be you know it, it in terms of small groups of 10 12 people often outnumbered in the wrong place you know getting the mission done husky seals that you know it's it's weird how you know, at the same time on a, on a on an operational level it's clearly showing up lots of of errors and faults and, and things but at the basic level of of men able to go and kill the enemy it's it's working really well yeah, and as you know, Eisenhower was under a lot of pressure to cancel airborne operations after Husky because of the disasters that happened. Yeah. And we're going to, when we talk about Fustian next, we're going to talk about a different type of disaster, not releasing gliders over water, but uh, Allied naval guns bringing down C-47s, yeah. which happened. Um, I just want to give one account. This is another American flight officer, and that's, that's my clock going off. I'm sorry, in the background on the hour. Flight officer... Uh, Michael uh, J. Samick, uh, he was flying glider stick number 99. So think about this. He's in that back of the formation where things went really bad. And uh, that's his load manifest on the left there, his actual, the guys that he carried, his glider load manifest. Um, you can kind of see he had 16 names on there. So he was carrying 16 paratroopers. And sadly, six of them were killed in action, but uh, drowned on this mission. 
But I want to read actually his description because I talked about so many gliders going down in water, and I'm going to give the, the stats here on my next slide, the recap of the disaster. But I want to read one of account of one guy going down in the water because this is there were 69 gliders that went down the water. And think about that tragedy and what those men faced when that glider, which was supposed to land on land, fell short in the water, okay, at night. Okay, these guys are disoriented. It's nighttime. They're on the gliders sink and fill up with water real quick. I want you to read you this account real quick so folks would have an idea of the, that the, the that moment, which is pretty amazing and, and sad. This is Mike Samick's own words. Actually, the water landing itself was fairly smooth. I did a sort of a three-point landing at stall speed. Water gushed into the breaking plywood at the front of the bottom of the cockpit and fairly slowly filled the fuselage. Now, remember, the Waco wings were up high. They were on top of the fuselage. So the whole back of the glider, the fuselage filled with water, the wings kept it afloat. So the wings were floating. The fuselage where the paratroopers were sitting in the glider pile sat filled up with water. So the men's are in their seats all of a sudden, and the glider's filling up with water. So they were they had to unstrap, they had to strap in for the crash landing. They had in the dark, filling up with water, they had to unbuckle their seat belts and make their way out. Now think about that. Uh, that 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 frame. Most of the glider pilots, as soon as they knew they were gonna go into the water, they told the paratroopers in the back, you know, so they could kick out the emergency doors at least, so they had an escape path. But uh, you know, it was get out of that glider any way you could. And there are many accounts of pilots just breaking through the plexiglass cockpit windows, uh, guys cutting through the fabric. I mean, they just had to get out of there. Um, so it, really sad. But I'm going to read just a little bit more from Mike Samick. So uh, I kicked out, kicked right through the fairing and the fabric next to the emergency exit on the right side and got on top of the wing. The whole thing floated nicely. To the best of my collection, most if not all of the troopers had gotten out from the border regiment got out. We sat on the wing and watched the shooting, that were, but we were shook up quite a bit. In retrospect, he said, this was really a stupid idea. Since I was a good swimmer, I decided to try to swim for shore. Notwithstanding the wind and the two or three foot waves that I had given my inflatable life raft to someone who had real problems holding on. So those high winds were causing, you know, two to three foot swells in the water too, pushing these guys further out to sea also. So that's what those guys had to face that crashed in the water. He shed his shoes. And I kept the canteen and condensed a tube of condensed milk. I started in the direction of the shore as I remembered it. After about 30 minutes, I saw another glider floating about 30 or 40 yards away. I swam to it and noticed somebody totally submerged in the left seat. I was convinced that uh, this was Joe Capite, Flight Officer Giuseppe Capite, and glider stick number 100, the, his American friend who was in the glider right behind him, one of my squadron mates. In the dim moonlight, probably because I could saw an ammo bandolier over his shoulder, I knew Joe insisted on always carrying a Thompson submachine gun and a bandolier. So he identified the floating body of his dead buddy in the in the left seat of the glider. And uh, so he climbed up on that glider. He was so tired, he had to rest. So he got on this other glider that was floating. And then I realized the men helped him climb up there. I realized I was quite cold and lucky to have found them. So... Quite an ordeal that Mike Samick went through. I'm just going to read a little bit more, folks, if you can bear with me. After the morning's dawn, we were indeed picked up by a ship. It was a Dutch sloop, which simply slowed down and picked us up out of the water. They helped us on board. After a while, they had picked up about 20 or 30 men. So most of these were British paratroopers. And a British Navy destroyer came alongside and picked us up. I'll never forget the taste of that cup of tea I was handed to by the Brits. And I couldn't put enough sugar in it to satisfy my need. I went off the deck and someone handed me a pair of overalls and sneakers, which I exchanged for my pair of pants as I had no shoes. So then he was so quite an ordeal that he went through. But uh, let's let's move on here. I know I'm yep. just hitting an hour now. So 19 American glider pilots landed in the water of 22 that flew this mission. The other four were on the next mission. Five were killed in action there. Their names are listed in their stick numbers. And another American glider pilot was actually killed, Major Tracy Jackson on a C-47 that was shot down in the Husky II mission. So there were American glider pilots killed on Husky um, on the Ladbrook mission as well as the British glider pilots. Next slide. Let's look at the, the uh, well, we're gonna talk about the, two days later, 
Well, the, remember the battle's raging on. You know, combat. You don't you don't stop in combat for bad things. You know, the the fight goes on, the mission goes on. A second resupply mission needed to go on, and that was called Fustian, and it was a smaller mission, glider scale wise, but larger with paratroop wise. So there were only uh, 19 gliders, uh, eight Wacos, and 11 horses. More British gliders this mission, but I want to point out. You can think about after this is two days after Ladbrook, the British glider pilots were not too keen on the American troop carrier pilots towing them. So for this mission, obviously, they wanted all the British glider pilots. So all the gliders on this mission were towed by your British bombers, the Halifaxes and Albemarle bombers. And uh, all the paras were pretty much in the C-47. So but there were 105 American C-47, C-53s, all from the, the 51st troop carrier wing that had to fly this para drop. Okay, slide. The Fustian mission results, um, mixed results again. But the the big difference on this mission were the orders given to the to the glider pilots. I just want to say this right here. The release point, all your bombers towing the gliders, they were instructed to fly directly to the LZ. There's no more release point over water. You know, no offset release. They flew directly to the LZ, and the glider pilots. Were, were given the authority to do their own release. Right. So huge difference between the orders that the British tug pilots were given than what the American glider pilots were given. And is that a giving. reaction to Ladbroke, or was it always going to be this way, do you think? I think it was partly, it had to be partly reaction just because of the, the, the disaster, you know, that, uh, and if you notice, never again in the war was there a release point over water that I know about. You know, all your big glider missions, one, they, you know, they landed in huge fields, but there were four American glider pilots. Two of them never got out of North Africa. Those gliders, one cra one of the one of the tugs crashed on takeoff. It was a British Albemarle, and the glider was able to cut loose, but they couldn't take off again. There just wasn't another available tug. Um, the other one, the glider became uncontrollable over Tunisia, they, so they never made it out of the water. Two American glider pilots did make it to land for this mission. Two of the four, you can see, eight of the eleven horses landed on Sicily. So better results, gliders landing on land. However, comma, there was a huge difference in the amount of AAA on this mission than the last. There was a, and all your accounts state this, there's a huge ring of AAA. Once the American C-47s coasted inshore, remember they're dropping pairs now, so they have to drop over land. Your LZ, your landing zone, drop zones were about five miles inland. There was a ring of AAA that was just, just horrendous. Um, the disaster, a new kind of disaster struck Murphy's Law. Murphy hit this mission. Where in, in the American sector, the U.S. Navy shot down 23 American C-47s with American paratroopers. On this mission, the Royal Navy shot down six United States Army Air Force C-47s, all with British paras on board, too, or forced down. A couple, One or two of those made it to Malta and landed. The, I think four of them went down to the drink, actually. But wow. I mentioned that horrendous AAA fire. In addition to this, nine C-47s were shot down by a AAA fire near the LZ. And uh, again, even though it was a smaller force, there was a similar type mission with the Paris. Their mission was to capture another bridge, strategic point, you know, to help the land armies land, uh, get across Sicily. Again, they, they, they were able to take their objective amazingly. But uh, I tell you, just... Uh, I know there's there's one account, and I'm going to state this for the record. You know, I know Mike Peters mentioned it, of a British lieutenant colonel pulling a pistol on an American troop carrier crew in the cockpit, who he thought you know was shying away from the AAA fire and not not driving on to the drop zone. Um, when you look at that number of aircraft shot down by AAA, it it shows they weren't running from AAA, you know, for the most part. It's just that that myth that, you know, the American C-47s, and that's one of the myths, I think, that came out of Sicily. Mm -hmm. The Americans were afraid to fly on Ladbrook and Fustian because into AAA fire. I just don't buy it. You know, you can disagree with me, but, uh, again, I think those numbers show differently. But that's no, my opinion. Makes sense to me. Okay. We're almost done here. Let's let's talk about the uh, the, the aftermath. Um, we talk about, obviously, there's a, a lot of finger pointing after this mission. Um, a lot of anger from the British. And I, I mentioned initially the Americans thought they flew a successful glider release Ladbroke mission. When they landed, the Americans 
they weren't celebrating, but they were, you know, every aircraft returned safely from Ladbrook. Uh, every, nearly every glider was released. They thought they had executed the mission. It wasn't to the glider reports. The true sense of the disaster, you know, was told. Uh, 252 men were drowned, you know, of the British uh, First Airborne Division. 69 gliders went down in the sea. Uh, initially, 352 men were missing as drowned, and that number was lowered. But still, 252 men is just, it was a disaster. 69 mm -hmm. gliders. It was the biggest disaster for gliders in the war. But I want to commend Lieutenant Colonel uh, Chatterton for his leadership immediately after this mission, and I'll tell you why. I know a lot of people were in Chatterton camp, and some of them were, you know. But one, he saw the need that he went immediately after the mission, even though it was a disaster, he went to Brigadier General Dunn. Those two men had a chat over some whiskey, and they decided we got to get to Eisenhower and the right people and let them know that glider operations – can be successfully executed with the light with the right level of training and planning. Okay, and those were the two key takeaways. And I commend his leadership of, of those two men, especially Lieutenant Colonel Chatterton, who just lost a lot of his glider pilots and men from his first air landing division on his mission. He could have been angry too, and and just but you know, and he had to control his men. You know, who some accounts say they wanted to slit the throats of the American troop carrier pilots that dropped them in the drink. I get that. He locked his men down in camps, but that's a leadership challenge for him in two different yeah. ways. One, to control his men. You got to keep that allied team together who's got to fight the rest of the war together. Yep. And uh, so I commend his leadership. And uh, luckily, they did look at the lessons learned and a lot of things were fixed for later in the war. Well, that's, but, the, that's the overriding theme, as we've talked about it on this channel so many times, is that the it's a generalization, but it holds and makes a lot of sense. Is the third right, the Axis tended to abandon things that went wrong even once. Even if they went slightly wrong, they just, okay, project canceled, out it goes. The Allies have much more of a long-term vision of this. So they go, okay, this hasn't worked. Clearly, there's things we can improve. How can we improve it? And we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, Sherman tanks have a, a, a difficult time at the first operate. The RAF Typhoon has problems when it first flies, it carries on. The, the, the list goes on of things the Allies did that weren't entirely successful on their first or even second time as they use it. But they, they, they go back and they they put their heads together and they come through the doctrine uh, doctrinal changes or technological changes and you you end up with a better product later on i think to me the tragedy of this is that the lessons were learned but they didn't throw out the project they 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 they, they pursued it in, and made it better exactly and you know war lessons are learned in blood in war you know that's just a fact of life um but there is a good news ending and we'll go one more slide I'm going to talk to, let's talk about what happened. A lot of the uh, the airborne units and troop carrier groups went back to England after Sicily, you know, for an invasion of Normandy. But the 51st Troop Carrier Wing stayed in the Mediterranean theater. And the, the story with the British Paris and with the British glider pilots in the Mediterranean has a good ending. So it didn't end at Ladbrook. And I'm going to give you three instances of what I call the epilogue and the good news story ending, Okay. On 21 February 1944, three C-47s from the 51st Troop Carrier Wing, 62nd Group, they towed three Waco gliders. They carried 22 British, six Russian officers into Yugoslavia, actually. They were supporting an SOE uh, emplacement there, and they, they successfully flew that mission, which, uh, as British supporting British special operation activities in Yugoslavia. The C-47s uh, then dropped 10,000 pounds of equipment for the British spe special operators who set up operations in Yugoslavia to help uh, Tito's partisans tie down Nazi divisions. It's just quite a quite a success there. And then from March to October 1944, the 60th Troop Carrier Group flew thousands of uh, missions supporting RAF uh, 338 wing there. Uh, I'm sorry, 334 wing in support of the, the British SOE, uh, which special operations executive, the British SOE there. In, uh, um, in Yugoslavia, but also um, Operation Mana. Most people aren't aware of this. The invasion of Greece from 13 to 17 mm -hmm. October, there was a 30, 30 gliders were towed, all piloted by British glider pilots, towed by American C-47s. They landed at an LZ outside of Athens, Greece. It was the second British independent para there uh, 
Brigade there, commanded by, that's uh, Lieutenant General Pritchard there, shaking hands or talking with the 51st Troop Carrier Wing Commander after the very successful Operation MANA. So it wasn't the end, you know, it was it was the beginning of, of just uh, para operations that continued on and glider operations in the Mediterranean. So I know focus shifted, you know, back to England and, and uh, France for the cross-channel invasion, but in the Mediterranean, para and glider operations and the 51st Troop Carrier Wing uh, flew throughout the rest of the entire war there in Italy, Greece, and the Balkans. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because, as you said there, in many people's kind of timeline, it just leaps straight from Husky, and then the lessons are carried on into Overlord and then Market Garden and Varsity. But the operations in the Mediterranean continue, and Airborne Form, we could go off on all, as you said, there, all the Yugoslavia and SOE and OSS and C-47s and missions and flights and recoveries and medical evacuations but that tends to get forgotten because it, it just attention shifts to, to, to France. But I'm glad you mentioned that there are other spec, uh, aspect there. And um, yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll show your last slide. Cause of course we mentioned it already and I'll hold up again there. There's the actual copy of the book that Mark sent me and you can find it on your, uh, your, um, your favorite bookstore and the link to Mark's website is in the, in the description below. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll wind things That's up. Really we'll, cool. We didn't have many questions because you were covering it as you were going along. But one from Peter O'Connell there. Uh, any comments on the relative advantages and disadvantages of night airborne operations? <laughs> well, I'll talk about night glider operations. They, they went to daylight ops pretty much after this, after Normandy. They, I think there's one more. Normandy was night glider ops, which went better. But still, I think for market, they totally went to daylight glider daylight airborne and glider ops and i think that was mainly because the advantage of the the nav to support better navigation ability and skills you know it, it give them a, a thumbs up in navigation because navigating at night because in world war ii you think about the flight instrumentation they had it was a tough skill to master night navigation especially low level um at night uh just uh you know the, the aircraft radars and instrumentation just weren't advanced at that time so they went to daylight airborne ops mainly because of the limited navigation skills but uh and that gave the able to drop what daylight the advantage daylight ops gave them was you could drop in mass mass formations the troop carrier drop formations became a lot wider instead of longer strung out they became a lot wider where you're dropping larger wider drop zones what Troops were dropped in mass altogether, so that's what daylight ops allows you to drop in mass. And as we know, as the, as airborne operations went on, they just did more and more things to maximize the chance of success and limit, as you said yourself, a commander's first principle is to limit losses. You know, the the fact that they didn't use pathfinders in Sicily, but they did later on. The the uh, anti invasion uh, invasion markings on the undersides of aircraft. That there's lots of things we can look at and say that was done, that was done, that was done, and it's all just little seemingly little things when you add them all together you're giving that operation a, a greater chance of success and i think that's the that's the learning curve you see it's not that there was a revolution it was evolution rather than revolution i think oh yeah you think about it in normandy not one allied ship i don't believe shot down a you know a, an american c-47 carrying paris 821 c 47 carrying paris into normandy and, and british you know dakotas carrying paris Tank gliders. I don't believe one was shot down by an Allied Navy ship, which was a huge step ahead after Sicily, the disaster. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and we could talk about that at some point in the future. But to wrap things up, we talked about it a little bit on the last time, your first appearance. You know, as a historian, you know, you, you're writing about troop carriers, you're writing about this, this aspect of it, but you read general histories, you read books about, you know, Operation Husky or, or, or are there, are there, myths that you still see being repeated about troop carriers that you kind of you know you go every time you read them that you wish you could address and cure you know it's uh the, the navigation skills were poor and uh that that part i'm not going to debunk you know they actually like i said the front half of that formation hit their target 50 percent of the gliders in those first uh first 12 16 tug glider combinations made land it's just that that formation disintegrated after that, you know, things just went furball. Um, you know, and I, I just, I think for me, for this, this mission was, I, I think the American, the formations trying to fly that formation at night just did it. That was a huge thing contributing factor that most people haven't really talked about trying to fly that four ship 
you know, parallel to the shore into a into a headwind after glider release. It just went went south real fast. Yeah, and definitely, and and again, I, I, we said this that we definitely said this in the first show is that someone like yourself who was serving more recently, you and everybody who's involved in transporting people and airborne forces and gliders and helicopters and and everything that is is coming. You all owe this huge debt of thanks to these pioneers because, as we we said, in 40, 41, 42, all of this pretty much was new. Uh, that that very oh, yeah. has been done before, and of course, with something so new, it was going to be a rocky path. But you know, now you can look at the not complete efficiency, but how 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 things were in your day, and and you can you got you must be able to see the direct lineage back to these lessons learned uh, now seventy years ago. Oh yeah, it's amazing. You know, early in my career, I met several C-47 pilots who flew in World War II at squadron reunions. Every C-130 squadron I flew in had a lineage to a World War II squadron. So I'd get to meet these guys, listen to their stories, and they 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 laid the path for us. You know, they laid the groundwork for troop carrier operations today: paradrop, resupply drops, uh, aeromedical evacuation missions. You know, just the the ability to airdrop large loads, you know, replace the need for the glider. You know, you can airdrop a tank if you need to, instead of having a glider. They didn't have that capability in World War II, you know, and the helicopter, you know, replaced the glider too. You know, they could move mobile supplies around a battlefield to small points. But uh, just the, the way night operations evolved in my career with night vision goggles and everything, you could just see it just continue to evolve over my career of uh, flying low level, no lights on the aircraft, landing, in the desert with no lights on the ground, you know, on night vision goggles in Afghanistan. Um, it's just such a, we just continued on where they left off. And uh, these guys were heroes. They were just part of the greatest generation, you know, British and American troops. And uh, it was a different war. It was uh, save the, the world from tyranny and fascism. It was a different war back then. And as a couple of people said in the sidebar, unfortunately in wars, lives are lost while processes are improved. That That's just, it's unfortunate, you know, as, as Peter Caddick Adams says in his Sand and Steel, as many men were killed in training for D-Day as were killed on D-Day, because that's what happened. Yeah. If, you're do if you're doing that kind of thing, people fall off cliffs, people get run over, they get hit by friendly fire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that is the nature of war. It's about, as you said yourself, trying to minimize those risks, improve the systems and, and go into each next operation, having learned from the previous one and trying to just keep keep refining and keep pushing towards a perfection you'll never reach but at least aim aim high yeah that that's the job of leaders that's what leaders do you know if you're not trying to improve your formation your 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 troop your formation whatever you're commanding you know that that's your job to to bring every man back home alive if possible you know as many as you can in combat Brilliant. Well, we will think everything's there, Mark. What I think I'll do is invite you back at some point to carry on talking about operations in the Mediterranean later on, because you know your book is is that thick for people to see. We only covered a slither of it today. There's so much more you cover, and you know we we, we want to get into the the Balkans and Greece and the other parts of the Mediterranean because it's it's such an overlooked um, area of the war, and some brilliant stuff was done, and some brilliant innovations, and some brilliant people that you wrote about. So we'll perhaps do that in the future if you don't mind. Yeah, I'd love to, Paul. I'm, I'm here, buddy. Appreciate you. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. I uh, say so I'm taking a break where I'm going to do some film work for the next few days, and then I'll be back on Friday. We have some World War II TV, and we have some World War One TV coming up with Lucy, and so keep an eye on the schedule. Lots of things coming up. Um, as for right now, thank you, for everybody, for your attention. Thank you for your questions, and I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>